Uh, this morning we're talking about climate change. And a couple weeks ago, somebody tried to trick me into talking about politics. Um, and whenever I tell people I talk about science and religion, I'm, I'm forced to talk about the two most controversial things in society, which is politics and religion. Um, so we're going to try and not, not get into politics this morning. And I'm going to try to avoid getting too deep into the science. Um, a lot of the times I feel like science communication just looks like people putting slide after slide after slide of charts. So we're going to have some charts because science is about data, but I feel like that's usually not the best way to do science communication, so we're going to try and stay away from that. Also, we've only got about 45, 50 minutes, so if you, if you really think I'm not giving your, your question fair attention, please stay and talk to me afterwards. I know a couple times I've cut people off for, for time purposes, um, and I... It, I, would, I would be glad to continue any conversations that I might have to cut off in the middle afterwards, just to make sure we have time to get to everything. Any questions? Everybody good? All right. Climate change is hard to talk about. Climate change is hard to study, even for experts. Um, it's hard to study for a couple of reasons. One, the numbers are just really big. When you tell people to think about really big numbers, their mind doesn't do a good job of it. So, for example, if I say, Picture one gallon, you think, easy, milk jug, got it. I say five gallons, you think, okay, five gallon bucket, got it. 50 gallons, and then you think of like a big oil drum, but your, your mental intuition for how big that number is is starting to slip away, right? So if I said 500,000 gallons or 500 million gallons, you don't know which one's closer to the actual volume of the Atlantic Ocean, right? Because at some point for human brains, we, when, once we get past a certain number, the, they all just go into the very large number category of our brain, right? And climate change is inherently about big numbers. So when people talk about history, they say, oh, 20,000 years ago, the carbon dioxide was this concentration, and 20 million years ago, it was this concentration. Most people have a hard time placing that accurately on a timeline because you don't think about numbers that big all the time. Um, a couple other factors... Misinformation is really common on the internet. Um, a couple, couple years ago, I wrote a guide to climate change. It was right after the election, and people were talking about the Paris Agreement, and a lot of people asked me, Matthew, what's up with climate change? So I pulled together a document, and it was so disheartening. I just thought, what happens if you Google climate change? Now, this is two or three years ago, but four of the first results on Google were not scientifically credible information, right? And, one, and I, I spent... I spent weeks hunting all of them down because I had an existential crisis about it. I thought, this article says blank. Is, is that true? That can't possibly be true. So then I spent a couple weeks double-checking everything the person was claiming, and they just made it up, right? So you have to be careful when you're dealing with climate change information on the Internet. Um, so climate change is difficult to talk about for a few reasons. But if I were to take the soccer ball and shrink the earth down to the size of a soccer ball, how thick do you think the atmosphere would be? Oh, you cheated. <laughs> how thick? Human hair, piece of paper, yeah. When I do it with youth groups, all right, points off, boo. <laughs> when I, yeah, when I, uh, when I come into youth groups and do this, I always skew the crowd a little bit. I say, oh, do you think it's two inches? Do you think it's two feet? And then, of course, they guess massive numbers. Um, but the reality is the atmosphere is thinner than a single sheet of paper. Think about that. On most globes you've ever seen in your life, the paint is thicker than the atmosphere is. Right? So we spend a lot of time the last couple weeks thinking about how small people are and how big and complex the universe is, right? We showed all these clips from planet Earth and Neil deGrasse Tyson and how, and like the, the clip that shows the scales where it zooms way into the woman's eye and way out to the galaxy level, right? And we read from Job 38 about how small people are in the midst of this massive complex nature we don't understand. And all that's true. And there's a reason I talked about that is because I think it's important. But it's also true that it's easy to look up at the atmosphere and think we're small and it's big, so we could never really affect it that much, right? And I hear this all the time from people who are skeptical of climate change. 
They say, oh, I just, the atmosphere is too big and people are too small. I just don't believe we could possibly affect that. Um, but once you realize just how small the atmosphere really is, um, I, think it, I think it helps put things in a, in a little bit of a different perspective. Because in the grand scheme of things, the atmosphere is really not that big. Um, we're closer to outer space than Chattanooga. Okay? We're closer to outer space than Chattanooga. Right? That's how thin the atmosphere is. It's like 40, 50 miles, something on the order of that. Okay? Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's right. If you, if, you, if you were able to climb a ladder as fast as you can walk. That's correct. Thanks, Katie. I trust you, too. Okay. Um, everybody okay? <laughs> yeah. All right. So the atmosphere is not that big. So we have this kind of inertia in our mindset about climate change where we think, yeah, like the scientist has such and such, but it's so big, how could we possibly be affecting that, right? And I think it's understandable where that thought comes from. It's good to be humble about the limits of what people can do, but it's bad to assume our actions have no consequences. And that's what, that's what climate science is telling us, is that from the last two or three hundred years have severe consequences for the atmosphere. Um, a couple other things before we get started. Yeah, just one thing, really. Um, I, Hebrews 11 talks about the language of belief and how belief and faith are in things not seen, right? So I, I believe in the resurrection, right? You can't prove that in the same way you can prove a scientific principle. You have to believe in it. It's a leap of faith on some level. So for that reason, I try to avoid saying I believe in climate change because it implies that you need a leap of faith to believe in climate change. But we're going to get into the science a little bit, and I hope you see, if, if you're not convinced, that's fine. I don't, I don't want to get into a long back and forth about it. Let's talk afterwards or get lunch or something. But I hope you see why I don't think you need to believe in climate change, why s climate change can be demonstrated to you. So let's look at the... The chart that everyone's seen. How many people have seen this before? This is the, the hockey stick graph. And people call it the hockey stick graph, which is kind of confusing and frustrating to me. Which It, it kind of looks like that, sure. But um, it's not like one person made the hockey stick graph, and that's why it's controversial. The hockey stick graph is just every single temperature record of climate looks like that. Um, and this is OK on climate communication. Um, you can see that the four different organizations and the four different colors really agree with each other, if you can zoom in close enough, which is helpful. You have NASA, you have the UK organization, you have NOAA, which is another American organization, and then you have the Japanese group, and they all agree, and that's great. But the problem with this chart is it's really boring, right? So like, you look at this, and it takes you a minute to figure out what stuff is, and it takes you a minute to decide if you should care about that. And the way the chart shows... You have no idea if 0.4 or 0.6 on the left there is a big deal or not a big deal or whatever, right? <coughs> so instead, we're going to look at my favorite chart in climate communication. And I'm going to start by having it look really zoomed out at first so you won't be able to see it very clearly because I want to explain for a second what this is. Um, so this chart has time going down. So I'm going to scroll down through it. We're currently at around 20,000 BC. And as we scroll down, uh, way at the bottom is present day, right? And then on the left is cold, and on the right is warm. So this x-axis is temperature, right? And the dotted line shows temperature, the average global temperature for that year. And if you're curious about how we get this data, it's actually really fascinating. You can use ice cores and stalagmites and stalactites and tree rings and a bunch of fascinating ways to get the data. So I'd be glad to talk about that afterwards if you want to. Um, but this is the average global temperature for this year. So this is 18,000 BC. And we think at 18,000 BC, it was about 4.5 degrees Celsius colder than it is now on the face of the Earth. Okay. And we're going to scroll through, and you'll be, able to, you'll be able to see once we get started, but I wanted to make sure you listened to me right up first. Okay, 
a timeline of Earth's average temperature since the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago. So and when people say the climate has changed before, they are correct, right? The climate has changed before, and we're going to see it. Like, that's what, that's what ice ages are, is the climate changing. So as we scroll down, you'll see the Earth's average temperature warm up a little bit because we're coming out of an ice age, okay? Um, and at this point in Earth's history, this was 18, 20,000 B.C., and New York had ice up to it, and Boston had ice well over top of it, okay? But as we scroll, you'll see it warms up a little bit. Warming a little bit, warming a little bit. 15,000 BC, if you've seen those cave paintings in France, that's about the time when they were painted. 14,000 BC, people in North America. 13,000 BC, we domesticate dogs. 12,000 BC, Chicago emerges from under the glaciers. 11,000 BC, and the, the global temperature dipped a little bit, right? So when people talk about climate changing in the past, depending on how they're saying it, it's, it is factually true to say the climate has changed in the past. And you can see that on this chart. People reach Argentina, 10,000 BC. Jericho, Bible uh, trivia word, 9,000 BC. We develop farming. Saber toothed cat goes extinct. Horses disappear from North America. Cattle domesticated, 8,000 BC, 7,000 BC, 6,000 BC, 5,000 BC. 4,000 B.C., invention of the wheel, fertile crescent, horses domesticated, the, the Egyptians are doing things, 3,000 B.C., earliest human whose name we know, 3,000 B.C. was this pharaoh, Gilgamesh, the pyramid, Stonehenge, chariots, 2,000 B.C., 1,500 B.C., uh, Iliad and the Odyssey, 1,000 B.C., fun fact, uh, Solomon in the 900s is the earliest biblical character who we have reference to from outside the Bible. So he's the first Bible character who, like, secular scholars are 100% sure existed. Fun fact. Keep scrolling. The Greeks are doing stuff. 500 B.C., the movie 300, the Buddha, Alexander the Great. And we're about to hit, who's our favorite? Jesus. Jesus. Sunday school answer. <coughs> okay, 500 C.E., Muhammad, Muslims in the Middle East, 1000 CE. People talk about Leif Erikson, yeah. Whenever you hear people talk about the medieval warming period, it is true that that happened in Northern Europe in the Middle Ages, but it didn't even register on the global scale. It was far too locally isolated. So when people talk about that as the reason why climate change isn't real, um, I think that's a really bad, bad excuse. Um, 1000 BC. Columbus, the European Renaissance, 1500, 1600, Shakespeare, Newton. I always talk about um, my alma mater, William & Mary, was founded right here in 1693. Steam engines, U.S. independence, telegraphs, and then the big one, the Industrial Revolution. Okay? Now see if you notice. You're going to have to, I'll zoom in if I can help you. It's a little hard to see what happened after the Industrial Revolution. And here we are, okay? So, here we are. And this chart was made in 2016, and uh, by this point it's actually, we're right around there, because we haven't made any meaningful action on climate change. Uh, the rain, uh, excellent question, always appreciate a good data question. The range of the x-axis <coughs> is in degrees Celsius, compared to the average from the mid-1900s. So it, it bugged me for a while trying to figure out why they picked this as zero. And the answer is they just picked it as zero because it was an average temperature for, the, for recent times so people could have a reference. If you wanted to, you could replace these with absolute Fahrenheit references. You could replace them with absolute zero references. And the data wouldn't change. You could just change the numbers at the top to represent Fahrenheit or Celsius, etc. Correct. Yeah, the, the conversion factor is about double. Yeah. Okay. Any other data questions on the axes? Great question. Okay. And as a side note, this is what science is about, right? So my, um, my undergrad professor would do this example. 
um, he, would, he would come up to someone and say, excuse me, ma'am, what's your name? Betsy, I don't believe you. Prove it. <laughs> right? That's rude, right? <laughs> I don't know Betsy very well. We had a good conversation about soccer. That's great. But it's rude if you don't believe someone in regular conversation, right? So in society, skepticism is bad manners. In science, skepticism is good manners. It's the opposite. The burden of proof is on the presenter in science. And you have to be able to demonstrate everything. And it doesn't mean that we're going to sit here uh, for the next five years and get all of you a PhD in climate science. But it does mean if you have real questions, I should be able to give you real answers or point you to someone who does, right? So he's asking a question about axes. And in the scientific community, that's not rude, that's polite, okay? To make sure people know their stuff. That's how you figure out frauds in the scientific world, right? Um, so asking questions about where my data comes from is a, a perfectly legitimate question, and science is all about that. Um, any other questions about the axes or Celsius or Fahrenheit? Okay. Um, and so just one more time, when people talk about how temperatures have changed, it's true, they have. You can see it. Um, but they haven't changed at all like this, okay? Especially, you look at the last, let's see, from 2000 CE all the way back to really about 8,000 BC. That's about 10,000 years where the global Earth temperature didn't change very much at all, right? It stayed within those middle two bars. Um, as, a, as, as a good question, um, the short answer is that it's exponential. So it was always going to get much, much worse, right? And I love, uh, we'll talk about solutions, uh, we'll talk, we'll get, we'll get to solutions. Um, but I, I saw, I should have, I should have printed and put it up on the slideshow, a clipping from a New York Times article in like 1911. Um, that was like scientific curiosities section. And it said, scientists are telling us now that all the coal we're burning um, uh, adds particles to the atmosphere. And in a, a long, long, long time scale, it might even affect the composition of the atmosphere, right? And so 100 years ago, people thought, oh, that's a weird thing. That might happen in the future. Um, so people, it's always been coming because we started burning fossil fuels. Um, any... Any other thoughts or reflections on this? How many of you have seen this before? Anybody? A couple of you. That's right. Okay. And those of you who came to my thing in, in January and February saw it. Almost anyone who knows me has seen this because I make everyone look at it. So the climate change isn't the problem specifically, and like, like hear this the right way, climate change so quickly because of an exact thing we're doing is the problem, right? So it's been this warm before, right? If you go back far enough in Earth's history, it's been this warm before. Even at the, like, the worst projections, if you go back far enough in Earth's history, it's been that warm before. It just wasn't very friendly to life at all, right? Or, it, or to life that looks like us. And especially if you look at pictures um, from China or India, some of the really populated cities, like, uh, and some of these, it, unless you've really studied it, it's hard to imagine how big some of these Asian cities are. Like the population of Tennessee crammed into Davidson County. Um, and the, the smog and pollution is just terrible. And their asthma, their deaths from asthma are significantly higher than the global average air pollution. I love this chart because it puts things you can think of in human history on the scale, just to give you a sense of the magnitude. This chart is on the internet, yes ma'am. If you go to my website, matthewdgroves.com, or if you Google Matthew Groves, I'm the number one Matthew Groves on Google, um, <laughs> you'll see this chart on my website, yes ma'am. So I feel like this is an example of not bad science communication, but mediocre science communication, right? And the chart's a much better example. You have to make climate change about human issues. You have to make climate change exist in a place people can think about it, right? Average Americans don't look at this and think anything. They look at this and have bad memories from high school, right? Um, so making data into something people can think about is a good way forward. Um, so I'm going to, where's, uh, there we are. I'm going to do, usually when I do a climate change presentation, I do the three facts of climate change, 
And we're still going to do that. This is like the, the three most basic statements about climate change um, that no one would disagree with. Anyone with a basic understanding of science uh, would agree with these. So I'll go through them. But it just happens that the United Methodist Book of Order and the, the official social principles of the UMC talk about climate change. So we're going to go back and forth between those a little bit. Um, <coughs> the, yeah, let me do the first UMC one first, actually. All right. UMC Book of Resolutions, 160, Volume 1, The Natural World. Oh, man. Is that, that is clipped off at the sides. Why is that clipped off at the sides? Come on. That's a bummer. It's okay. It's, it's close enough. I'll read it. Um, first thing, we acknowledge the global impact of humanity's disregard for God's creation. Rampant industrialization and the corresponding increase in the use of fossil fuels have led to a buildup of pollutants in the Earth's atmosphere, okay? And we'll get to the rest. You don't have to worry about reading the rest besides the bold part. We'll get to that in a minute. So that, this is fact number one about the science. If you burn fossil fuels, carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere. So industrialization, rampant industrialization that they mentioned, and the corresponding increase in the use of fossil fuels have led to a buildup of pollutants in the Earth's atmosphere. This is the use, this is the buildup. And this is just kind of basic science. So if you all, we, we, we call life carbon-based life. Um, so everything on Earth that is or ever was alive is made of carbon. We're all made of carbon, trees are made of carbon. Um, all the materials that were ever made from like animal fur are made of carbon. And if you burn that carbon, the carbon goes into the atmosphere, right? So smoke is the really obvious, easy example. So when you see diesel fuel, the smoke's a little thicker, so you can see more carbon, kind of a rough estimate way to look at things. Um, and so this one's pretty clear. If you burn stuff, the stuff you burned goes into the atmosphere, right? Okay. And if, yeah. So if you think about it this way, um, you would expect to see a steady rise in carbon dioxide since people started burning fossil fuels, right? 17, 1800s, people discover oil and coal and uh, gas. We start burning them for fuel, and carbon dioxide should go up in the atmosphere, which is exactly what we see, right? And this is from NASA, uh, NOAA, technically. And what they did is they went to Hawaii and put an observatory on top of a tall mountain in Hawaii, and the thought being that it would be isolated from population enough to have a good general estimate. And there are other stations as well that get similar results. Um, and you can tell that carbon dioxide has been continually rising in the 1900s. Um, does anyone have a guess for a bonus point about why it goes up and down a little bit? <coughs> Correct. The seasons. Uh, the real reason is Russia is so big that all those trees grow in the spring and suck up carbon dioxide enough to lower the world's average. And then it just increases when all those trees die in the fall and their leaves release the carbon back. Okay? Okay. But so it, it continually goes up and up and up, and the, the jaggedness of the line is just because the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere have summer and winter at different times. Okay? And <coughs> it's easy to see how this is so this is, this is a very recent chart, right? Last 50, 60 years. Um, but this number is actually kind of unprecedented in human history. So if you look at the long-term history of carbon dioxide, the chart we just saw goes back to like here or so, right? Um, 400,000 years ago, and the chart we have, which goes back before civilization, was just like right here. If you go all the way back 400,000 years, um, carbon dioxide does go through a steady cycle that matches the ice ages, right? It, it's part of the planet's delicate cycle of going through different processes and regulating itself. But ever since people started burning stuff, the slope of this line is effectively straight up, right? So the carbon dioxide has shot up 
so quickly in the last 200 years um, to a level that has literally never been seen in the history of human life on this planet. Okay? And if it's a reasonable question to say, how do we know exactly where this carbon's coming from? And I love this chart. Um, it's a little blurry on the big screen. This is one of the, the like, magnificent things about science is we figured out how to have satellites circle the Earth and take pictures of invisible things to help us see where they're coming from. So this is satellite imagery of where carbon dioxide comes from. Anybody see any patterns? Roads and cities. It's a population density map, effectively. And the really fascinating thing is out west, like Nevada, Utah, etc., you can literally see the interstates, right? Uh, because it, the population density is so low that the only place where there's a lot of carbon being emitted is on those interstates where the, where the cars go, right? <coughs> so I think the first fact about how people have burned fossil fuel and made carbon dioxide is pretty, in, pretty incontroversial. Um, and I do want to say, just real quick while we're here, that carbon dioxide's not inherently bad. Carbon dioxide's not evil, it's just a chemical, right? And it, it occurs naturally in the world. Um, and the bad thing about carbon dioxide is how much there is of it right now in the atmosphere. It's overwhelming the atmosphere's ability to, to deal with it naturally. And that's because people dug up fossil fuels. And a lot of the times in environmental movements, um, a lot of the language ends up saying fossil fuels are evil, coal is evil, and like, I'm from Appalachia, so like coal's a personal topic for me. But I think it's important to remember that the only reason we have our current standards of life is because of fossil fuels, right? So a lot of people say fossil fuels aren't evil, they give us medicine, therefore we shouldn't do anything about climate change. Like, I think the logic is wrong there, but it's true that fossil fuels have given us our current standard of living. They've given us modern science and modern medicine, right? So it's not as easy as just saying fossil fuels are evil and we should stop using them for that reason. Um, if we didn't have fossil fuels, I would imagine the life expectancy would be a lot lower. We wouldn't be able to travel, we wouldn't be able to learn, we wouldn't have the internet, right? So fossil fuels are concentrated carbon that we figured out how to use to give us energy. They're not inherently wrong, but we do need to figure out a different way to get energy. Any questions? Everybody good? Yeah, great question. Um, it's called sequestration is like the technical word for it, getting carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and you said other than planting trees, actually planting trees is one of the, the best ideas we have, is just planting trees in crazy amounts, like trillions of trees. Because when trees grow, they suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, there's, there's other technologies that, that are like working on that. That's an area of research and development that I think we should give a lot more money to at the U.S. federal level um, because that is, that is a technology people are working on in the short answer. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. This leads us to fact number two. If carbon dioxide goes up, temperatures go up, okay? And this is just the greenhouse, the greenhouse effect, basically, that you may remember from middle school or high school earth science. Um, <coughs> carbon dioxide acts as a, a blanket around the earth so that the energy we get from the sun stays with us longer and s soaks up is the wrong word, but carbon dioxide acts as a blanket. It's like you're sitting, you're sitting by a fire and the sun is the fire and we're the planet. Then all the energy is coming from one direction, but if you put a blanket on, your whole body will stay warmer, right? Um, and I don't want to get too far into the science of the greenhouse effect. Um, aside from just pointing out that if you look at the historical record, gosh, I don't know what's wrong with our slides. Paul had trouble last week. I should have double-checked all of these. Um, so you can't see the axes at all, so it's not really helpful. Um, but the top one's carbon dioxide and the bottom one's temperature. And this just demonstrates that the greenhouse gas effect is true in history, just the way we know it's true in chemistry. Whenever carbon dioxide's up, temperature follows. Um, I want to read the next chunk 
from the Global Climate Stewardship Statements. Um, gosh, that's a bummer about the screen. Okay. Um, these greenhouse gas emissions threaten to alter dramatically the Earth's climate for generations to come with severe environmental, economic, and social implications. So the, the UMC Book of Resolutions is saying climate change is a big deal and it will affect life as we know it in many different ways on planet Earth. And this is fact three, which is a small change in temperature in temp leads to a big change in everything. Okay. Um, so we're really in this happy little Goldilocks temperature. And it, it may not feel like that all the time, because like I'm from the mountains, so I think Nashville's hot in the summer. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're actually in this, this very delicately balanced Goldilocks stage, where if we move the temperature too much warmer or colder, it'll have large consequences for life on planet Earth, right? So the chart you may remember, at the very top of it, it talked about New York and Boston. So this is our, this is like the, a temperature spectrum. Um, and just for comparison's sake. So before the Industrial Revolution, we were ballpark right here, and now we're a degree or two warmer, right around one degree Celsius warmer than we were. And people talk about, oh, we gotta keep warming below two degrees Celsius or one and a half degrees Celsius. You might have heard some of this language from the Paris Agreement. Um, and it's easy to think, well, two degrees, what's, what's the real difference, right? As if, if we change the temperature of the room by two degrees, you might not even notice, right? But if you change the whole average temperature of the Earth by that much, it has a huge effect. So the last time the Earth was five degrees colder, New York was under a kilometer of ice, right? And the last time the Earth was five or six degrees warmer, New York was under a, like a football field of water, right? So we really do live in this like precarious, delicate little, little Goldilocks zone where it doesn't seem like two degrees makes a big difference, but two degrees makes a large difference in the consequences of life on Earth. We're gonna talk theology in a minute, and especially next week. I think the historical record is pretty clear that God won't stop people from doing terrible things to ourselves. Um, so that's kind of my default answer is that uh, a God whose providence allows for all the terrible things in history, um, we don't have good reason to think that God would just magically stop climate change, right? That's kind of my default answer on that question. I'd be glad to talk to you about it afterwards. And we're gonna get into theology a little bit uh, before, th before the end and for next week. Um, we get one more thing from the United Methodist book. The adverse impacts of global climate change disproportionately affect individuals and nations least responsible for the emissions, right? So the countries who have emitted the most, the US, Western Europe, Russia, um, will suffer the least for it because we already have infrastructure built up, because we used those emissions to build infrastructure. Whereas some of the poorest countries in the world don't have infrastructure, and so they're going to have a harder time dealing with the consequences. Um, it, it, the, the comparison is, if you live in Miami and sea level rises, you can up and move, right? If you live in a small Pacific island and sea level rises, you may not have the resources to up and move, right? Whereas um, p countries like America have way more responsibility the countries like Kiribati, a small Pacific island. So it's, it's much more our fault, but they're gonna have a harder time dealing with the consequences than we are, right? So that's why I think it's really a justice issue. And I'm glad that the, the UMC says the next line, which is, we therefore, because this is a justice issue, we therefore support efforts of all governments to require mandatory reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and call on individuals, congregations, businesses, industries, and communities to reduce their emissions, right? On a justice issue. Yes, Katie. Whereas on the one hand, if you live in Puerto Rico, it kind of is too late. If you live in Houston, it kind of is too late because you're already experiencing terrible weather events, right? Um, we talk about Hurricane Harvey, we talk about Hurricane Maria, 
Um, if you live in the Midwest, you're already getting terrible flooding, right? You may have heard, um, political comment, careful, but Pete Buttigieg is from South Bend, Indiana, and he, he, he talks about this over and over again, how South Bend has received a 500-year flood and a 1,000-year flood in back-to-back -back years, right? So how many more 500-year floods do we need 12 months apart to realize something's already happening to our climate, right? The comparison I make is um, it's like a baseball player who uses steroids to break the home run record. Every individual home run they hit might have been clean, but the steroids increase their probability of hitting a home run every time. So like you, you, when you're talking about weather, you do have to be careful. You can't say climate change made this hurricane happen, but you can say climate change makes hurricanes and extreme weather events like flooding significantly more likely, and then they happen more often. Um, I'd be glad to talk afterwards if you want to. I um, want to finish up your thought real quick. Um, this is a, like a, a practical concern. So on, on, on one sense, is it cheaper to stop it from happening or to react to it as it happens? And there are some things where it might be cheaper and easier to react to climate change than to try and prevent it at this point. Um, and that's like a, a really technical argument in policy right now about what areas might it be not worth trying to prevent anymore and we should shift resources to prevention uh, or to, to reaction. Um, but in general, I think pe people have this idea that we'll either stop climate change or we won't. Like it's a switch you'll flip and we'll either we'll prevent it or we won't prevent it. But it's really a sliding scale, right? So the, the chart I had a minute ago, this chart, if we end up right here, that's not great. But if we end up right here, that's significantly worse, right? So I think that um, the conversation about prevention versus reaction is like a reasonable conversation for some people to be having. Um, and there's a way to have that conversation the right way that honors the science. Um, but I, I would like to see more people focused on prevention to kind of get at the, the root of your question. Um, when people talk about setting up a resilience office, but they're not dropping their emissions at all. Yeah, that does frustrate me, absolutely. If you're not even trying to deal with prevention, because if you live in Sub-Saharan Africa, if you live in Southeast Asia, if you live in a poor country on the Pacific, you don't have resilience offices. Um, so that's why prevention matters, not just for us, but for the whole world. Somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. I don't think General Johnson's an idiot, but I don't think that paragraph is there. Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? We're coming up on time a little bit. Um, I had hoped to kind of turn the corner and talk about like, hope and optimism and solutions before we finish today, because one of the problems in climate communication is it's always a downer. And if you leave people feeling down, they feel hopeless and helpless, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, Methodists are one of the denominations that are actually talking about this and actually caring about this. So hats off to you all. You already have a framework you can act in on climate change. That, what other things contribute besides carbon dioxide? And that's a, that's a big question. A couple things come to mind. Uh, first off, um, methane, you might have heard of methane gas and especially chlorofluorocarbons and, and hydrofluorocarbons, which are used in refrigerants. Those gases are way worse than carbon dioxide at warming, but there's a lot less of them. So that's why you don't hear as much about it. Um, they're another piece of the puzzle. Whenever you hear people talking about cow farts, uh, which cows don't even really fart, that's like another problem, um, it's methane. Cows do produce methane, uh, which, is, which is another piece of the puzzle. That's why people talk about cattle in many ways. Um, and then the other half of that conversation is nature, how we interact with nature. And if you cut down all the trees, then the carbon in them goes into the atmosphere and they can't suck carbon out of the atmosphere, right? So if the more trees you cut down, the less resilient nature is in the face of all this carbon we're putting out. Melting of the permafrost, yeah, absolutely. So things like that are one reason why the curve you saw way at the beginning is um, kind of exponential. 
because there are tipping points. Once you cross them, they, they reinforce themselves and get worse and worse and worse. So, for example, in the permafrost, um, once we melt the permafrost in the Arctic and the, the, the tundra, like in northern Russia, um, carbon and methane trapped inside it will be released into the atmosphere. And because the ground's been frozen, that gas hasn't been released for thousands and thousands of years. But once that gas is released, warming will increase and it melts even more permafrost. So it's like a feedback loop you really don't want to start. We're, we're, we're at time. Next week, we're going to talk about solutions. So you do have homework. Um, I want you to think about ways you, and specifically West End Methodist, might be able to make a difference on this. Um, and we're going we're gonna to sit down and talk about it in small groups next week. And next week, I, I realize we kind of left it on a downer, uh, which I, I didn't want to do this morning. But next week, we're talking about solutions. We're talking about things you can do. We're talking about agency people do have. So think about ways Weston Methodists could use less energy, could waste less supplies, less materials, um, solutions like that. And we'll talk about them next week. Um, also next week, we're gonna, I'm going to try and leave like 15 minutes at the end for kind of catch-all questions that we didn't necessarily get to over the course of the summer. We've covered a lot of territory over the last eight weeks. Next week's the last week. Um, so if you do have questions, to, uh, bring them bring next week, and we'll leave time at the end and chat about them afterwards.